we've got a, 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 I want to discuss a couple of things with um, the data that we've been using um, and the data that I've provided to the geospatial and the, um, the time series analysis only because um, there's a couple of interesting things that I want to explore with the prediction. And I'll, I'll explain, uh, you know, in a bit more detail shortly, just once everyone um, everyone joins. We'll, we'll, we'll get started at three minutes past. We'll just make a start, save some time. Okay, so again, thanks for coming. It's good to see everyone. And it's good to see everyone contributing to the Slack channel um, and, you know, developing their own sort of pipelines and, and fit, fit, developing their own work for each pipeline. It's very good to see there's a lot of collaboration going on. Um, can everyone hear me? I'm just a, someone said they can't hear anything. Just give us an indication if you can. Yeah, we can hear you and can see you. Yeah. Yeah, check the audio settings. Um, so we've had the four data pipelines produced, um, three for the vehicles, uh, three for the accident data and one for the vehicle data. However, um, with the time series analysis and the geospatial analysis, it would be interesting to see the full um, width of the data. So we have the original data set is, for, is up to, until 2017. However, the data we've been using for the prediction part um, goes to 2010. There's a little bit of, so I've, I've sort of done this on purpose um, because with the geospatial data and with the time series analysis, of course, more data is a lot better. The geospatial aspect, it'd be very interesting to see, you know, how things have changed over the course of the, the years. Um, and we can do that in an interactive map where we can scroll along and just see the patterns on, on the map change. With the time series analysis, the more data, the better, and we can get better predictions and we can monitor it in, you know, by the day, the time, the month, the year, whatever we want to do. Now, how this relates to the prediction part of the of the of the um, of the project, the severity prediction, we've got a window in the severity prediction, um, which I think is 2007, I believe, to about 2010. So we've got 10 years, uh, sorry, three years, and we will build a model to predict on the data within them three years. Um, we'll create a test set and a validation set. So it'd be interesting to see if we take a test set from a, a different distribution of dates. So say if we take the, you know, the year 2017, for example, and we use the model we've built to predict the severity of the accident data, how will it do against the data from a different, completely different distribution? Um, that is the idea. And it's, you know, this happens quite a lot in industry that data sets come from two different distributions. And in those particular sort of time frames, something may have changed, but we can't tell that until we put our model to the test in that sort of context. And then that opens the door then to a number of different model evaluation uh, methods. Um, the main one, I, I use quite a, a lot is um, ad, adversarial validation. So how that works is we build a model and we use the data from 2007, 2010. We input data from the, um, the you say 27, 2017 year, for example, and the score is very low. So we need to figure out why. So a, a method to do that is to basically take all the training data from 2010 and add in the 2017 data. But what we do, we flag the 2017 data with an, an extra column and that column is, it, it will be assigned one. All the, all the values will be one and all the older data will be zero. And we run that through the model 
And if our model can tell the difference between the old data and the new data, that means the data is from a completely di different distribution. So the model we trained originally won't work for future predictions from a different distribution, and we have to tackle that. There's a couple of mechanisms we can we can use to sort of figure out how the data has changed over time, but we'll leave that for the model evaluation part. But that is a sort of a facet I want to introduce to this project only because it will, you know, in industry it happens quite a lot, but it's not really spoken about very much. And it's a very, you know, complex sort of idea to fix. So that is a, a, a sort of, that's why I've done that. That's why I've used them two different distributions. Um, but it will be, you know, it, overall, if we can, if we can, we can build the model have it predict on the newer data. And if it does, if it does fail, I mean, it may not, it might be exactly the same sort of distribution, but that's how we check. Um, and if it does fail and it doesn't perform well on a, a year's worth of data that the model hasn't seen before, that's when, you know, the true deep dive into evaluation happens. So um, I hope you understand why I've done that. Um, it will be very interesting. And it will, you know, broaden your um, learning experience, especially if you move into into a, a machine learning or data science role. Um, data distribution and building models, you know, it isn't talked about a lot during online courses and stuff, but it is a very real issue that we, we come across quite a lot. Um, and, you know, the distribution doesn't have to be in terms of date. The distribution, it, it, it could be from a statistical standpoint. It could be that, um, you know, if you're looking at, at, at product sales, um, at, you know, at, at, and you're trying to predict uh, the customer behavior, the customer behavior may change for some reason. Maybe you've upped your prices and that has resulted in a change in your customer's buying habits. You don't know that until we put the the model to the test, and it's how to to um, to sort of account for that and make a stronger model to to understand that there may be dis different distributions. Um, so yeah, that's why I introduced the these data sets because it will be it will make good experimentation, and it ensures that we understand our data, and you know any possible outcome we can we can attend to and solve. Um, so has, has anyone got any sort of questions about that or, you know, would need some, you know, uh, or want, want any more in-depth information? I will provide a couple of resources on um, data distribution and how we can come about, um, you know, protecting our model from it or, in, you know, improving our model to take into different distributions. Um, there's a couple of document um, documents I've got that could probably explain it better than me. It gives it, you know, a, a greater mathematical insight into it and, and how we can we can solve it. Um, you know, far far too much time to, to, to cover in this. Um, far, far too lengthy to cover in this amount of time that we have. But it is, um, you know, it it is a good a, a good learning experience, and you will be faced with it in in real life. So that's why I've included it. Um, what I've seen in the Slack channel so far, everyone's cracking on with some EDA. There's been a few um, um, problems with the data, just in you know, in terms of removing the date columns and stuff like that. But as far as I know, and as far as I can tell, that's been rectified as of yet. Um, is there anyone on the call who'd like to share some insights or any work that they've done or any sort of um, opinions on, on what's been done so far? Let me just double check. People can share the screen just in case. There we go. If anyone wants to share the screen, please go ahead. No. That's okay. Um, has anyone got any questions about the this, uh, the data at all and, and the distribution? There's a hand raised there. Oh uh, yes, hi Rich. Uh, oh hello. Uh, I just saw the I just saw your message in Slack. You said that uh, 
the data has been rectified and we need to run it through the data pre-processing, the final notebook. But when I check the GitHub folder, I see like a bunch of notebooks there. So I am quite not sure which one are you referring to or is there anything yeah, the, on the imputation strategy that, yeah. So. Each data set had a different imputation strategy. Um, and that was only because we can, you know, from a beginner's point of view, we can see how um, each in imputation strategy affects the distribution of what's being imputed. Um, the data that I provided you is the full 2 million lines data from 2007 or six or seven, all the way up to 2017. Because you're handling the time series part of the project, I thought that you could use a lot more data um, all the way up to 2017 instead of just up until 2010. So in terms of, of, of what um, processing file um, to use, I would probably use the, um, well, to be honest, let me just think what we could we use. We've got the, let me just double check what we've got. Because um, I've made sure that each data set is slightly different. So let me just load my GitHub up and I'll tell you which one to use now. Um, tasks, data engineering. Yep. So if you could use the LGBM impute um, notebook on on the on the full data that I provided to the Slack channel, that would um, that would give us then three separate data sets for the accident data, all imputed in a different way. Um, I provided the geospatial project with the full two million lines as well. Um, if you if you joined a bit late, the reason for me doing that was to, of, of course, for the geospatial and the time series analysis, the more data, the better. And it brings us up to closer to modern day. But also the fact that we're building a severity prediction model um, with the data that runs till 2010. What I want to do is experiment with checking the model accuracy and model performance on data from a different distribution. So this data um, is from, you know, we can we could isolate 2017, for example, and we could try our train model on the data from 2017 and see if it gives the same sort of uh, performance as it, it does on the data it's trained on. If it doesn't, we know that that data has changed its distribution and we can figure out why and figure out how we can amend that um, to, to make the model you know uh, perform a lot higher um, it's just for experimentation purposes um, especially for beginners it just gives us that extra sort of detail that may have not been covered in in much depth during um, online courses and within books as well the only book i know of that covers this sort of, of information, this sort of difference in data distribution is the Kaggle book. Um, and they use, well, one of the most popular ways to use it is adversarial um, validation, where we basically tag the data um, that we believe is, is from different distributions and see if a model can pick that up. And if the model can pick that up, that means the data is from a different distribution. So we have to come up with um, a more robust feature engineering phase to um, to counteract that. That was the reason for it. Um, but the main, you know, that is a bit of, of a bit of fun for us to get to when we go to the model deployment and evaluations stages. But of course, the original intention was to to, to provide the time series and the geospatial heat map um, projects. Um, much more data, much more thorough data. Um, but are you okay to take that LGB imputer and 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 use that on the data? I've run it through and it and it is quite effective. Um, I have, but I didn't export the data um, into a into a separate file. I'll, I'll leave that to you and then perform any sort of EDA you want on 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 that. Then and uh, we should have some interesting results. And it'll be interesting to see the EDA from the geospatial and heat map, air time map analysis, um, only because 
that data has an extra million lines and is from a different distribution. Maybe we can see that within the EDA. We'll soon find out. Um, is that okay, though? You happy with that? I'll take I'll take that as as a yes. But yeah, um, it's been shared. The link to the to that imputing notebook has been um, put into the chat. But I'll give you the rest of them there. That is the main sort of uh, the main branch, the main folder with the with the impute, imputation there. Notebooks. Okay. So uh, hello. let's just. Oh, hello. Uh, we were the team of vehicle analysis pipeline and uh, yep. we were doing some analysis. Uh, could I just share my screen? Yeah, of course. Yeah, you should. You should have the permissions to go ahead. Uh, okay. So I think my screen is visible right now, right? Okay. Yep. Uh, so uh, the main uh, problem statement was to create a model to predict the likelihood of specific cohorts, right? So we could not come to a conclusion, right? What specifically it meant, like uh, if we are predicting a vehicle to be uh, have likelihood to be included uh, in a collision or not, or you know, if we are pro tackling it as a novelty problem and how we gonna evaluate it. So uh, as we are coming uh, the analysis and uh, we found that uh, there are some specific uh, data related to accident and some vehicle related data and then some conditions for accident and some data related to driver and some fields uh, that were named as missing. I, I guess this is the field for pointing out if the respective corresponding uh, fields were having null values or not. Right. So. Um, so. Uh, we have a uh, uh, from above analysis. We could see that uh, most of them are categorical, right? And uh, uh, we have a pure data set of only vehicles involved in an accident. So we don't have any vehicles that were not involved. So the main problem is how we can test it. And yeah, well, and we have and and here. So let's see. So actually, one problem was uh, we found that uh, engine capacity of one vehicle was about 96,000, right? So is this common uh, to have 96,000 CC vehicle in uh, Liverpool or not? Or if we should exclude it from our analysis or not? And uh, and moreover, we could find that uh, there is a vehicle named as a horsepower, ridden horse, ridden horse. It mentions that it is a ridden horse, right? So it is not an electronic vehicle or a mechanical vehicle. So uh, what should we do with this? And uh, yeah, pretty much it. Yeah, so you do raise a very interesting point and I'm glad you mentioned it. Sometimes, like the data we have, as you said, is for vehicle collisions. So the only data you have is the ones that have crashed. Um, yeah. So we know that these vehicles are definitely. So how are we going to say whether or not these vehicles are likely to um, to be in accidents? Yeah. Because all of the ones we have have been in accidents, so we can we can say it with some purpose. So in this sort of circumstance, the import some of the most important data is the data we haven't got. So this is a perf you know a perfect example of. Um, What's the word? I can't think of the word off the top of my head at the moment, but there is a very famous sort of illustration of this um, with German warplanes back in the war, where the ones that would return will be, you know, were, were damaged. And um, they were saying, like, we need to reinforce certain parts of, the, of, of these because um, they've come back and they're, they're highly damaged. Um, where should we put the extra armor? And the ones that returned obviously are the ones that survived so it's su survivorship bias um so the ones that didn't survive were obviously shot in different places than the ones that did survive this is the same sort of thing we've only got the information of the the vehicles that have been in collisions so how are we going to make any sort of um analysis at all 
to predict to basically say what vehicles are most likely to be in accidents when we've only got a very small substrata of data that indicate you know a vehicle that have been um in collisions so we can we can of course summarize the data we have we can say as far as we're concerned the most um, vehicle the, the vehicle that was in the most collisions out of our data set within our specific time zone would say be a ford or what or whatever it is um how are we going to to, to try and, and compare that to vehicles that haven't been in, in collisions so this is the sort of extracurricular work that comes around these sort of projects you're only as good as the data you've got so to answer them sort of questions we need to look in other places to maybe source some data maybe we can source some data from the departments of transport that gives us a an indication of, of every vehicle you know a, a registry of every vehicle on the road that exists in britain and um, to make the model the number and things like that and then we can weight them together with our data that is a possibility to do that um so the point of, of, of this is being we can make an analysis with the data we've got and we can make you know a couple of of indications of, 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 of who is involved in the most accidents who is involved you know what what's their age what's the background what vehicles are they driving what was the you know the purpose of, of, of their travel or whatnot we can make certain assumptions with the data we have on that but we can't really make a, a prediction on them because we don't have the data that people who w were not in accidents yep. so i wanted to sort of leave that open to discussion of how are we going to solve that are we going to get gather more data about those who you know the vehicles that you know exist in the uk or exist in liverpool for example we, i mean we don't have to do the entire uk we can narrow it down to make it a bit more easier or do we just stick with what we know and we can say you know based on these particular years with the accident data we can say um you know with with a certain degree of certainty that people that were in collisions the, the vehicle that they you know the the drove the most was a ford the age was this particular age um and you know and and so on and so forth so that is completely open to discussion and i am you know i'm more than willing to to take whatever you think would be best um it would completely depend on how we wanted to you know where does this fit in into our solution where does this you know we, we're going to end up with a with a with a product that will predict accident severity we can we'll also have some insights about where these accidents are most likely to happen and where the hotspots actually are based on our data we're also going to be able to tell you you know what vehicles are mostly involved in the collisions based on the data we've had over the past two years how are we going to you know that's going to be our solution it's going to be very much retrospective can we enhance it to have sort of you know to weigh it up against the you know a, a, a background rate a background rate of how many vehicles are on the road in the uk um how many mo you know different models are on the road in the uk how many different age groups are are driving vehicles on the uk roads so they're the sort of questions we need to answer and we need to incorporate into our overall solution so it's a very 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 good point that you've raised and you know maybe sometimes it's not obvious um you know these sort of you know we we've got data sets of incidents stuff that's already happened so how are we going to adapt it do we need to adapt it to to you know to to do we need to, to predict into the future of what of what vehicles are going to be involved in collisions? Maybe, or maybe we don't. We can say with a certain degree of certainty based on our history, this is what we've got and this is what we can say for for definite. Um, again, it's the data we don't have that might paint the bigger picture. It's just whether how we where do, where do we find that data and how do we incorporate our data? So yeah, that's a valid point for the time being in the EDA let's build let's let's draw some insights for the data we do have when we come to feature engineering when we co come to model development th that's when we sort of ask the questions what are we missing the feature engineering we can add features is part of the feature engineering do we need to add a sort of background information about the entirety of 
of the vehicles on the UK road to make any sort of worthwhile predictions, or do we go based on the retrospective information? That is a very interesting discussion, but I'm glad you picked up on it because it is valid. But yeah, so that's uh, what. Go on, sorry. Yeah. Uh, well, Rich, so we have some uh, analysis uh, based on the engine capacity, and the minimum engine capacity is one cc, right? And maximum goes by uh, ninety six thousand. So, uh, is it an outlier, or is it common uh, to have uh, those sort of vehicles in Liverpool? And uh, one of the yeah. yeah. One of the things uh, our friend had done uh, is uh, he had grouped by uh, the make and model and counted uh, mm -hmm. uh, which are more likely, which model of uh, which brand is more likely to be an accident, right? So, uh, and the next thing, uh, so uh, uh, the age of vehicle, it, it, it seems like uh, uh, not uh, the new, uh, the vehicles which are about like um, seven years old, right? So they are more likely to to be in an accident uh, than the old vehicles. Could it be like uh, reused vehicles uh, due to reused vehicles or not, right? Mm -hmm. So that is the point, a sort of questions uh, we were asking uh, from this data, yeah. right? So, it, is, uh, it is interesting, the, old, the older the car, it seems, the less yeah. of accidents that they're in, other than seven. Yeah. You know, yeah. so that's an interesting sort of trend. And, you know, the questions we need to ask, why, why is that? You know, a twenty-year-old, thirty, was it twenty-year-old car? You know, yeah. in in the UK, a twenty-year-old car is classed as a classic. You don't have to pay car tax. Generally, the people, you know, I'm making just stereotypes here. Who are the people who will generally own classic cars? It's going to be either people who have owned the car from the start, so you know, might be older in age, or it might be people with a lot of of, of money and buy classic cars who don't drive them regularly they buy them to show them to display them and stuff they're the kind of questions that i'd be asking myself in this sort of analysis there's probably also a drop off like most people are replacing their cars after a certain duration and so yep. there aren't as many older cars on the road most cars are being replaced i would assume probably around that seven year mark um it yep. seems strange that seven is nearly triple the size of any other category um that seems like a statistical anomaly uh because there aren't going to be seven there's not going to be three times as many cars that are seven years old yeah on there and everything else is is in line so it, that just yep. seems like a strange anomaly to me but it, it, um, it could be a complete it could be some sort of outlier but it would be interesting to examine the data the rest of the sort of uh, metrics, um, the features, sorry, for the seven-year-old car and see if there's any sort of trends of who's driving these seven-year-old um, year cars. Um, I know for uh, uh, in, in the UK, if you were to buy a, a car on finance, um, the usual term is four years. After four years, you can replace, you can upgrade your car. Do you know what I mean? So, what you're saying about the you know turnaround on the vehicles of people buying you know you know it gets to four years on average and then people upgrade to a new vehicle again so it's very interesting uh, it's a very interesting point but i'd be curious to see why that why the seven-year-old vehicles are, it seems to be involved in more accidents um i would you know we, we could take a look at the sort of demographics of the people who are driving it to, to that might paint a, a bigger picture um could it be, you know, that when a car gets to seven years old, that's when they start to basically fall apart and they need to be, you know, to, you know, the, the, things might go wrong on them and um, you, the wheels pop, fall off or, or something like that. Do you know what I mean? Let's take a deep dive on that. I think that's a very valid, um, a valid point. And as you say, Michael, yeah, it, it is interesting because the turnaround of, of newer vehicles on the roads would be, generally much higher in tip you know because a lot of people buy cars on on higher purchase finance um company vehicles you know usually between three and four years you get the upgraded to a new new model so yeah i think that's yeah michael that's a very that's a very very good point to, to be raised and, and you know i think we should look into it make, take a deep dive on that and take a look at what you know why it why is seven a uh, statistical anomaly uh, one thing more, Rich, uh, it seems interesting that cars have 70% uh, occupancy in overall accidents, right? So most yeah. of our, 
yeah cars are involved in accidents so Riz, I, uh, we were requesting if uh, the data engineers in the first week uh, could just uh, merge uh, merge the severity column uh, from the accident data to the vehicle data uh, in the uh, simple imputed uh, data set so we could look at uh, how the model and make our engine capacity would uh, impact on the severity of accident right uh, so we wanted to do that analysis. So if the guys yep. could, uh, yeah, uh, merge that column to the data set, then we could do more analysis based yep. on our assumptions. Yeah, that's a, that's a good idea. And, you know, just to let everyone know, just because we're done with one particular phase of the task doesn't mean we can't return to it. As we go on and we gain more insights out of our data, we might have to return to, um, you know, the pre-processing stage to modify the data set slightly. Just be, it is an iterative iterative process that's the way it's going to be and that and as you as i say you, the more data you get your hands on the more you understand it the more you think hmm i could do with that feature being in this data set to give me an idea of you know which vehicles are involved in the most severe accidents um so yeah that is it, it, it you know let's hook let hook up with the um the data engineers and let them provide that data and then you re rerun your analysis on it Thank you, Rich. But yeah, as you say, the, um, the 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 ridden horse. I mean, yeah. So obviously, something's happened there. I've mean, either hit someone on a horse, or a horse has kicked the car, or something like that. Um, it's up to you whether we keep it. Technically, it, it's classed as a vehicle. Any sort of, you know, if you're on the road in by any means. It's classed as a vehicle. I mean, if you if you're if you're riding on someone's back, uh, you know you're not going to be you're classed as a pedestrian. But a horse is is a a legitimate uh, mode of transport, and it will be classed as a vehicle. And there's certain um, rules of the road about vehicles interacting with horse riders. So in the UK, if there is a horse on the road, you have to leave a um, a two meter gap while overtaking the horse you're not allowed to um, sa um signal your horn uh, because it might scare the horse and throw the rider or you know co you know cause the horse injury so there is built into the uk's highway code the rules that we have to to to, to, to follow on you, you know while you're on the road do involve horses that's why they're classed as vehicles and so it'll be interesting to see you know what you know what what, what was the severity of this um of, of this, you know, incidents with, with the horse and, you know, how many is there? It, you know, there's a very low percentage of that, but it'd be interesting to see that in like a, you know, a, a, a true number. Um, but yeah, for me, I'd leave it in, but it's entirely up to you. As I say, it's a very, very small amount. Um, but what else have we got on there? Um, if you just, could you just scroll back up to where the, the type, the vehicle types are, just so I could see what else we have. So there they are, yeah. So we've got electric motorcycles and trams. The electric motorcycles, they are relatively new on the UK roads, and the highway code was updated to um, encompass them. Generally, um, they're illegal if you were to, they look like normal bicycles, but obviously they got the electric engine. Um, they're illegal to drive on the sidewalk, but you can ride them on the road, but you need to be insured and they need to be registered as well. So for electric motorcycles, for me, that is only low because they're relatively new to the UK roads. And the tram only, let me think, maybe what? Maybe three or four cities in the UK have trams. One of them is Manchester and another is Edinburgh. I'm not entirely sure where else. I only know there's some in Manchester and some in Edinburgh because I've been there. Um, so that one might be interesting to see how many accidents have, have happened in, tra in, in within trams. We already know there's only around 50 accidents that have been reported in Scotland because Scotland's a different um, a different jurisdiction. So, you know, we could more or less rule out Edinburgh. We can check if them tram accidents have happened in Edinburgh because Edinburgh obviously is 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 within Scotland. Um, so the rest may fall to Manchester and. If memory serves, I've got a feeling uh, the city of Leeds has trams, but I could be mistaken. But that is one to research. Um, so, yeah, that's why trams are quite low. Is, is only, they, they exist in only a, a, a few, few cities around the UK. So, yeah, yeah, please continue. 
Yeah, uh, so the last one is uh, the junction location. So it seems like a lot of accidents happen within uh, 20 meters of junction, right? Or approaching uh, during the junction. Mm -hmm. It seems like uh, in the UK, uh, it is a uh, left hand side road, right? Uh, driving, right? I have to think about that for a second. We drive right uh, uh, in the right. Right. In the right. Okay. I was thinking if it was uh, due to the direction changing or some kind of thing. So, a uh, lot of accidents happen at uh, the junction or while leaving or entering the uh, junction. And yeah. yeah, it was quite interesting because in junction, a lot of people don't follow the rules <laughs> properly. <laughs> they, yes, they yeah. Understand. Yeah. Well, that's uh, right. It's 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 yeah. where, uh, you know, junctions are where the most vehicles come together at any one time. Um, and they that would be something I would expect. Uh, yeah. Uh, Actually, the the where you're reading that wrong. The the highest percentage is not at or within 20 meters of a junction. That means oh, that yeah, it is, yeah. 42 yeah. percent of <laughs> all accidents are happening nowhere near an intersection. So yeah, yeah. yeah so it's it's in fact almost. Uh, but it interestingly, approaching junction or mid junction and clear junction, when combined, those ones are adding up to approximately a similar number, and so mm -hmm. it seems like it's it's split about fifty fifty, where half of them are happening uh, near a junction and half of them are happening uh, far away, more than twenty meters from a junction. Yeah, well spotted. Well spotted. Yeah. yeah. Thank um, you so much. Thank you so much, Mr. Michael, for contributing to our group. You are uh, too much hectic yep. <laughs> Thank so, you. So yeah, that's a, it, that is an interesting point. Um, it'd be interesting to see, you know, especially in the geospace, we'll probably be able to see where those accidents are happening, and you know, you know what what what. Could we figure out what's causing them if they're away from the junction? Then you know that says to me that there should be normal flow of traffic, um, because as you say, they're not slowing down, they're not stopping twenty meters away from a junction. People are, you know, it's it's it, it's an interesting observation. Um, so yeah, I think that you know that one should be explored. But well spotted, Michael. Bloody bloody reading it wrong. Um, okay, yeah, there's less than a minute on this call. Allow me to refresh and everyone read rejoin and we'll pick up where we left off. Okay, welcome back. Just give it a second. Uh, I know there was a number of, of hands raised uh, during the last discussion. Does um, Always, do you want to jump in? Uh, yeah, so uh, uh, Shravan uh, was uh, talking about merging, merging the accident severity column from the the from the accident data set to the vehicle vehicle data set and we know that yeah. uh, first of all uh, the number of rows in both both the data sets are different and secondly the accident indexes of both both the data sets don't match like if i just uh, take out the accident severity column and merge it to the vehicle data set then it creates du duplicate uh, not duplicates but null entries and so is there any strategy that i can use to approach that yeah it's a good point and that is because we know that every vehicle that is in the accidents gets assigned one um accident index for that particular accident so there is a couple of of ways we could we could join it and we you know we could use the perhaps the pivot function in pandas make a you know like a pivot table in, in excel but in pandas which will capture each incidence on that um index that would be a a a possible um method to do it um yeah that would we probably need some more discussion does anyone else have any any ideas dunya you've got your hand raised uh can we just do a uh, left or right zone or uh, we could do the simple join uh, we have to uh, do inner okay. join in that because uh, uh, yeah that uh, because that column is unique so even if we, I think if we will do pivot, pivot, we will miss pivot table, then we won't get much from that. So inner join would be the best from uh, mm -hmm. as far as I can think. Yeah, 
We can try try a, a couple. I mean, yeah, try the inner join first. If not, try a pivot and see what and, and how that what that looks like. Um, we just have to, you know, in in, in case of any join. We need to make sure, like the the data still makes sense. It's still, you know, it's, it's still got integrity. Um, and if we can't work it out like that, I mean, it's, you know, what could we do? Yeah. My my first go to would be the pivot because, but then it's it's a little bit more difficult to um to perform EDA on that. It's a little bit more comp um fiddly to 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 manipulate. Um, but give it a go. Try the inner join. Try the pivot and see which one um, w which works better. Um, Faison, is it Faison? Yeah, is that how you pronounce your name? Sorry if it's not. Um, you had your hand raised as well. Do you want to um, discuss what you found? Am I audible? Yeah, yeah, we can hear you. Okay, so Sharavan, Sharavan, me and uh, Hassan was a part of team for the uh, for the. For the project number four, uh, for the task four that we are doing, uh, we did some initial EDA. So for the um, for the steps uh, to to determine the severity for the particular vehicle, we need the severity column. Uh, I think we should perform the inner join on both the data sets, and that's how we can uh, uh, cater the need of getting the severity in our data set. Uh, okay. Except that uh, we also want to know the uh, the insights you guys uh, or any questions or any uh, suggestions you guys want to give us, so we can add more value to the to our input. Okay. Have Have you got um any? Could you share one of your notebooks just so we can take a quick look of what so what you've done the, so far? The nope. notebook the notebook that one was showing was mine. Uh, I oh, okay. The... Sorry. Yeah. Got yeah. Actually, cool. I was uh, I was on a different machine uh, that I performed the ED on a different machine, and I'm taking a class for, from laptop, so yeah. I was not able to. Yeah, that's it. fine. And it, well, if 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 you performed it in a join and it, and it works quite fine, um, we can rep replicate that, and we can and we can draw that data in. Uh, Dunya. So hi everyone. I reach. Hello. Uh, I would I would like to know if you can if you could uh, re-explain the idea that you shared about uh, Manchester and Indebra. The um the data distribution. Yes. Yeah. So, okay. So what we've got um in our predicting um severity, the data set is a million rows, takes us to two thousand and ten. Um, and I've provided the geospatial and the time series analysis data, and that has two million rows, and it goes all the way up to two thousand and seventeen. So if we build a model um, using the data that goes to 2010, we're going to split that into validation and we're going to split that into a, a test set as well. We're going to build a model on that and we're going to predict the severity using the 2010 data. And hopefully we can get it, you know, we can evaluate it and we can get it, you know, a well-performing uh, model with, with, with a high sort of degree of accuracy. The next test to evaluate the model is then taking a, a year that the, the data from the year that the, that the model hasn't seen. So, for example, if we take um, all the entries from 2017, feed it into our model and have the model do some predictions. Now, if the data is from the same distribution, meaning nothing has sort of changed drastically with the data, over time, the model should, should perform just as well. However, if the model doesn't perform well, we know that the, the data may be from a different distribution. Now, we need to identify that. And there are quantitative ways to identify it and qualitative ways to identify it. So one of the sort of qualitative ways to do it is something that we would have to do outside research for is between the year 2010 and 2017, were there any sort of road laws changed in the UK? Have any laws come in that have been issued by the UK government that have generally made the roads safer? That would be 
a sort of concept drift within our data because what we're seeing is these improvements in our data it has fundamentally changed the distribution of our data in a way that you know we can't particularly quantify now the other is the quantitative data distribution so it could be statistical would the you know say if there's less um road traffic accidents on the on the roads in 2017 um is this because they just ha you know there just has been is something are, are the vehicles being driven different are they safer are they less likely to you know to to you know fail we have to we have to have something in the uk called an mot and it's a yearly test where your vehicle is is tested to see if it's it's worthy to be on the road have those tests been more stringent and allowed better quality cars to be on the road have new cars that have, uh, are on the road are, are the young are they generally younger in in 2017 so they're less prone to have an accident for, in terms of mechanical failure it's them sort of distributions that we need to account for and in in real life in industry this is a problem with with um taking data from different distributions something may have changed either statistically or sort of concept driven change so as i said before changes in the uk road laws that have improved safety that you know may have reduced or changed the people uh, changed the vehicles that are mo most likely to be in accidents so it's them sorts of things that we have to look at when we're, we're when we're evaluating our model and what I mentioned before about the Kaggle book, um, this happens quite a lot in sort of Kaggle competitions. There's something called adversarial validation. And what we do is take our original training set from a particular distribution, this distribution being 2010, and we mark it with a Z, we make an extra column and mark it with zero. We take our new distribution, that being 2017, we add an extra feature we mark it with the number one. So we can clearly see which pieces, which rows of data are from which distribution. We then combine all that information into one big data set, and then we split it, training, um, validation, and testing. And we set the target to be the binary classification of zero and ones, which identify which data comes from which distribution. We run the model, and we make predictions with it. If, if the model is able to basically separate the zeros and ones, we know that our two distributions are, are separate. They're easily identifiable that they're from different distributions. And that means there's a problem. That means that we will not get a, a model that will be able to make solid predictions because it is easily determining, determining between our two distributions we don't want that. We want it to fail in that sort of sense. We want it to not recognize that there is two pieces of data from a different time, different distribution. And that is something that we come across in industry all the time. Adversarial um, validation is one of the ways to identify it. How we fix it, that's a whole other story. Now, as I mentioned before, there could be numerous reasons why this this um, this this information is from different different distributions. It could be a concept. It could be that over time, the UK road laws have become more stringent, um, which means people are generally driving safer. Um, it could be down to the vehicles. It could be you know it, it could be a things, but it's something that we have to take into consideration, um, and I think that will come. That will be something quite heavily discussed in model evaluation if we have that problem. We may not have that problem. I'm hoping we do because it's something to really broaden our, our learning experience. It's a really good and interesting subject, which, you know, which really illustrates that, you know, machine learning isn't just stick the data in and see what happens. There is an, you know, there is an, you know, a plethora of, of, different things that could affect our model and that's one of them so fingers crossed it, it you know in terms of our model performance let's hope it doesn't happen but in terms of our learning discussion let's hope it does uh, because we'll we will have to fix it
and it's there's no you know there's no easy way out kind of thing it's just something i wanted to add to the project that would enhance everyone's learning whether you're the beginning or the next bit because it, it it is it is something that isn't talked about quite a lot within the circles but it is valid and when you're putting a model into into production that's something you, you have to mitigate your, your model is going to degrade over time and one of them reasons is why is is, is your data come from a different distribution so ho hopefully that answers and clears up anything you had yes thanks rich Do you understand and I would yeah i'd like to know um, how we can get access to this book kaggle book oh the kaggle book um yes. you can buy it online um either on, um in in hardback or the uh, pdf i've only got the pdf version for me kindle um but it is a really good book it's not so much about it's not like an introduction to machine learning, but it shows you what Kaggle is, Don't what trip. are the sort of um, what are the sort of ideas that people have on Kaggle to solve solutions. It's a problem solving book. It gives you a couple of ideas of how to solve your problem, and, and one of them is is dealing with um, data from different distributions. Um, if you're able to, if anyone's got time, um, take a look at that. I wouldn't worry about it too much, but it's definitely one to put on your research, um, your, your, your research um, list, um, how to solve different uh, data distributions in machine learning. Um, very important for production and very important for maintaining models in production. So you can share with us this book? Yeah, I think yeah, I think I've got it. I think I've got it on me on my computer now. I've got it on my Kindle. I might have to send it back, but yeah, it's um, it is it is a really good book. Oh, okay. Thank you. No problem. Um, okay. Has anyone got anything else to share or any questions, comments, or any any ideas um, over the next um, that they have for the next couple of stages? Uh, you can jump on the microphone or, or, or share your screen or whatnot. Um, no, just as a oh, go on. sorry, Michael. Right. Yeah, just as a quick jump in. Um, so we've kind of at this point in time, we're kind of uh, you know dividing up into our into our subgroups that are we're trying to answer slightly you know different questions with the same data. Uh, I think it's important when you're starting to do the EDA and you're looking at the the, the data that you look at the data through the lens of the question that you are trying to answer and that with your team with at least within your own group that you have uh, an understanding of specifically what question you're trying to answer with the with this data like what do you like um so my team is trying to predict the severity so we know what our target variable is like we need to like you like essentially you need to know what you're what you're aiming for and i think that's an, it's important to kind of look at your data through that lens uh cuz I, I think it will help you to uh to to explore the data in a more productive way because as we've seen throughout this meeting we can chase a million threads in a thousand different directions um but uh, like at the end we 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 want to be able to 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 answer a, a question and we each kind of have our own questions that we're trying to answer at this juncture. So I think it's, I think that, you know, uh, there does like, you do need to kind of look at this through, through the idea of like, uh, you know, it, it, when you're getting together with your, your smaller teams, you know, make sure that everyone understands like, what is the question we're, we're asking? What do we think we need from the data do we have that information or do we need to get more data? Like these are all things that you should, should kind of be asking and seeing if that information is present already or if there's something else that you need to do. And I think that's a good place to kind of, you know, those are questions that can be answered through, through the EDA. Uh, and, and uh, you know, and I think Rich mentioned this earlier, you know, this has been presented in a way that is very, um, you know, data preparation, uh, you know, exploratory data analysis, on and on uh, towards, uh, you know, eventually making a model, but it, he's mentioned it before, this is iterative, and you will want to go back to do steps again, like, 
you'll you'll move forward and you'll do something in the model and you'll learn oh this thing that we did like we used uh, a certain imputer and that is causing a problem that we think is causing an issue like uh, you know go back try a different imputer see what that how that changes things like you're you're going to want to iterate on this and i, I think it's important to to kind of you know understand and realize that like early because it, it'll make the the entire process feel you know it, it is you know i i'm i think i mentioned this with when i talked with my team earlier uh in the week you know we're talking about being data scientists i think it's important to understand the science portion of that and that's that like establish a hypothesis test that hypothesis determine if it is correct or not and then if it is not go back and change the experiment so that you can test it again and keep doing that until you get to a point where you're answering your question in, in an affirmative way. Um, that's kind of, I just wanted to add like a little, that's my little thing, but uh, yep, back to you, Rich. Yeah, no, it, it's an absolutely valid point. And thanks for that, Michael. It's, there's, you know, when you're working with a, a pipeline, like we've got, and we're, we're trying to move to, to provide a solution um, with all these pipelines, every pipeline's got, as, as as Michael said, a slightly different question. The chances of you getting that question spot on in the very first run, uh, minimal, if not impossible. The entire process is iterative. We need, you, you, you know, you'll you'll figure some things out in EDA that might have to push you back to the data pre-processing. You, you might do that and get to the feature engineering section and then realize that you'd have to go back again and then maybe create some new features aren't suitable for a model so i have to go back to that stage again it's it, it is it's making as many experiments and as many trials as you possibly can to home on to the question that you're trying to ask and it is that's the that's the the data science part about it it's running multiple experiments and trying to squeeze out performance trying to squeeze out understanding of the data and of the you know the the the, the, the outcome um what I would say is our particular solution is going to be multifaceted. So we're going to, in my in, in my head, we're going to pretty much have a, a a dashboard or a website of something which is able to give us a full a full and thorough look at all our data and what all our insights that we found. We want to have documentation about what we've seen within the data. We want to have a a a, a heat map that can either look at the whole UK or you can zoom in into in particular areas of the country, or maybe let's just do it with Liverpool. They're the sorts of things that are an ultimate goal. Now, we can bring all them together to be a solution um, at, the, at the deployment part. But for the time being, as Michael says, concentrate on the pipelines question. Um, there will be many threads that you will follow. Some of them may be really useful. Some of them might be a waste of time. It's up to you as the data scientist, as the machine learning engineer to say what is good enough. When when should we stop? We don't want to go down a rabbit hole. It's very easy to go down a rabbit hole. I do it all the time and I have to pull myself out of it. It's no one when to say that'll be good enough to answer our question. And that's when to stop. And that's when to move on to the next part. It's up to you to dictate that though. But, you know, if you feel like you are going down the rabbit hole, talk to anyone else on your team, talk to your group, talk to me. Let's 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 decide what's good enough for our purpose. Um, but, yeah, thanks very much for that, Michael. It's very, uh, very insightful. And that is, you know, that that is what we need to drill down into uh, beginners and, and people more experienced uh, alike is is, you know, answer the question, stick to the question and don't get sidetracked. Um, don't worry about messing up. Don't worry about making mistakes. It's all part of the pro process. The only way you're going to learn is make the wrong decisions. That's the, that's the only way. So don't be scared of it. If something something goes wrong, good. You go back and fix it. That's the way we're going to learn. That's the way we're going to make a solution. And that's the way we're going to have a fantastic project. Trial and experiments. But yeah. Um, okay. If anyone, Hello, if anyone got any, ah, anything yes. else, yeah, go on. Hello. So, uh, Rich, uh, had we imputed the missing values uh, in the data set? Had we done that? Yeah, the 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 data sets um, that Vivek put together have been imputed. 
I shared two data sets into the geospatial and into the time series. That everything is is generally clean. It just needs to be imputed. Uh, imputed. Oh, why I'm asking this question is because uh, as per as uh, as per uh, my thinking, uh, we should do EDA before imputing the values because when we will impute the values, our EDA will be biased. Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. So I think. Um, so I think we are moving in the wrong direction over here. What do you say? Yeah. No. That is that is a valid point. Um. As I say, there's no wrong or right here. Um. It will create bias because it, you know, depending on what imputation methods you you've used, it could um, uh, falsely inflate some of the categories or some of the values or what or whatnot. So, that is a very valid point. Um, and there might be reason that, if, if, uh, like, uh, if we are getting like one as a C, uh, CC of engine, it might be the chance that it is due to the imputation only. Yep, that's right. So. What are we going to do to, to solve that? Let's do some EDA without any sort of imputation whatsoever, and let's compare it to the other groups and see and see what the difference is. It'll that give us sure. a much more broader understanding uh, without the bias. It, it is a good point. But again, you know, it's one of them examples. We, we've gone down a certain path. Is that path 100% correct? No. Let's try it a, di a slightly different way and see what happens, and then we can move forward. So, yeah, good point. Absolutely. Okay, okay. And yes, one more thing that uh, EDA that we will be doing on the time series, I think it would be very much different from the normal EDA we yeah. are doing. Yes, okay. definitely. And definitely. Uh, what 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 are we, uh, what are will be the things that we have to consider on that? To be um, for the time series, like I um, need one example. I need only one example, then I can manage. Well, because the time series is you know it's obviously going to be heavily um, heavily based around incidents counts over time and stuff like that. So my main focus when I, I would be doing EDA for the time series problem, um, if we're working on, say, the accident data, I would, you know, my idea would be to, 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 to group some of the dates together in terms of days of the week, um, times of the day, um, the years, and just, you know, do a count of, of you know, what sort of... Um, what am I trying to say here? So what sort of incidents happened within these time frames? When when were the severe accidents? When were most of the severe accidents? When were most of mm. the slight accidents? What times of day? What years there was? What vehicles? In? Add every part of the EDA would be based on the, and based around the sort of temporal aspect of the data. So a lot of my analysis would be, you know, times of, of the day and the dates and, and whatnot, and then seeing what led from there. The, t the top in my head would be the time series and then how everything feeds into that would be the sort of pyramid underneath it. Um, looking at the sort of, um, you know, for example, the, the age cohorts, like what are, you know, the accidents that have taken place, say if there's 100 accidents and it's assigned to um, those between the ages of, of, of 25 and 35, what time of the day was that happening? Uh, yes, yes, I got. Uh, I uh, I got your point because I was also thinking in this direction. Was uh, the thing yeah, was I need yeah. to verify that uh, uh, whether I'm moving in the right direction or not. Yeah, yeah, because because the time series will be monitoring it over time and trying to predict into the future. The a, the EDA will differ because it will be very, it'll be temporally based. Um, build everything around your time frames. Um, that would be my advice. Um, and of course, as you say. If you can do that without the imputation as well, just to, to, to remove that bias of any sort of, you know, imputation technique, it may be, a, a, you know, a very useful insight when we compare it to the other the other um, EDA tasks we've got. Sure, sure. Um, cool. That's all from my end. Uh, I had a, just a quick comment for something else to consider for the time series analysis. Um, it might also be worthwhile to consider, you know, maybe not necessarily during the EDA phase, but during maybe during uh, feature creation. Um, you could use, you could create some sort of like sliding window style aggregated um, features that are like, you know, you know, how like average number of accidents that have happened in the last seven days. And you can just move that along and, you can take a, a sliding picture along every single 
you know, date point in within your time. Oh, yes, yes. So we call it a moving average. We call it right. Yep. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. Definitely. And, the, and the, so those are some things that, that you can also like that maybe not for the EDA portion, but certainly to consider for feature engineering. Yeah, oh, yes, yes, yes. Definitely. Yeah. And it, you know, it could be, there could be, you know, in terms of the feature engineering as well, there might be opportunity to do some Monte Carlo simulations as well. When we get to, when we get to feature engineering and just to see how, you know, that's part of the time series, um, time series process, mostly used for sort of stocks and shares and things like that. But it might be interesting to see if we can sort of gather our data in a sort of numerical format, see what a Monte, Monte Carlo simulation would look like in terms of, of maybe severity or um, simply occurrence, um, the occurrence amount over a particular time frame. Um, but yeah, that is later on in the project. For the EDA though, yeah, base everything, base all your insights around the sort of temporal frame. That would be my advice. Okay. Has anyone got any other questions at all or any other comments? Okay. Not a problem. What we'll do then, we'll call it quits there. Um, thanks very much, everyone, for coming. Um, it was a great check and we've discussed some great things. I'll share some um bits and bobs in the knowledge sharing channel. Um, I've already shared some um, some information about adversarial validation, about your, 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 your um, differences in data distribution. Um, but I'll, I've got some more at hand um, on my personal computer. Um, so I'll, I'll post them as soon as I can. But OK, um, if everyone's cool, we'll call it quits there. Uh, Manasseh, yes, I think. I'll I'll add you again. I don't think it's. I think it might be going to your spam email. But Manasseh, yeah, I'll add you to the GitHub. Not a problem. But thanks very thanks very much, everyone. I will catch up with you soon. Cheers.